copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 132 regarding missing adults. Be on the lookout for Mr. and Mrs. Henry Steinhauer. This elderly couple have not been seen since 5.30 Friday morning. That's all. Rolling and quick. wonder why it is that year after year, Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline continues to power more police and emergency cars than any other brand. It is because Rio Grande Cracked has one advantage which no other gasoline can claim. Here in the West, Rio Grande is the only company licensed to manufacture gasoline by the Sinclair cracking process, which is recognized the world over as the most efficient refining process known. Rio Grande has invested millions of dollars to build one of the finest cracking plants in America. The gasoline that is cracked in this great refinery has qualities you'll find in no other gasoline. Many cities and counties have tested Rio Grande crack, and their unbiased records prove conclusively that motors develop more power, speed, and acceleration with this scientifically balanced gasoline, and yet instead of being more expensive, Rio Grande crack with tetraethyl is actually the cheapest gasoline they can buy. Figure your own gasoline purchases from the viewpoint of miles per dollar. And you, too, will find you can enjoy police car performance in your own car at no extra cost. And now it is our pleasure to present Chief of Detectives H.S. Seeger of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Seeger. Good evening, friends. The average citizen's concept of the police is limited, naturally, by his contact with them. The motorcycle officer, who perhaps gives him a ticket for a traffic violation, or the radio patrolman, who may answer his call about a barking dog. It is our hope, and the hope of the sponsors of calling all cars, that this broadcast may give the citizen and taxpayer a clear idea of the complicated complicated organization which lies behind the officer he may casually contact. It is an organization of highly trained specialists, criminologists, chemists, ballistic experts, an organization of hundreds of men employing the most modern systems of communication, an organization whose efficiency is not limited to the community it serves, but is an important cog in a great machine of similar organizations which represents society's only bulwark against the forces of crime. Your policeman is an honored soldier of a vast army which 24 hours a day does battle in your name in a never-ending war against crime. November 20th, 1935. In the University Division Headquarters of the Los Angeles Police Department, Sergeant A.H. Wingerton is taking down a routine report. What are the uh, names of the missing persons? Mr. and Mrs. Henry Steinhauer. Their address? 1839 West 4th, uh, 43rd Street. How long have they been missing? As far as we can tell, since 5.30 yesterday morning. Your name? Britton. George Britton. Mm -hmm. I am the engineer at the Lewis Radio Company. Mr. Steinhauer works for me. So what makes you think that something has happened to Mr. and Mrs. Steinhauer? Well, Henry Steinhauer's worked for me for three years or more. He was always punctual. Sometimes he would tell me that he might be late the next day because he had to pay the gas bill or something like that. But the thing about Henry was that he never was late. He'd managed to do his errand and still get to work on time. Mm-hmm. When he failed to show up for work yesterday morning, I thought it was strange he hadn't told me that he'd be late. And then when he didn't show up all day and wasn't at his desk this morning, I began to get worried, so I called the house. Uh, Mr. Drake here answered the phone, and, uh, well, maybe he'd better tell you himself what he knows about it. I see. Uh, what's your full name? Leroy Drake. Address? I live with the Steinhaus. I'm a nephew. When did you last see them? Oh, my aunt came to my bedroom door about 5.30 Friday morning and said that 
She and Uncle Henry were going to San Peter to see the landlady about the house. She said they'd be back later, but they didn't come back. It's got me worried. They never went away like this before. Well, we'll get a broadcast out to all cars to look for them. No, 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 wait a minute. I don't know whether that would be a good idea. Why not? Well, if they aren't in trouble and they're gone, say, to San Diego to the fair, they wouldn't like the publicity. Henry would be pretty angry, I'm sure. Well, the only thing we can do in that case is to check the hospitals in the morgue. Perhaps that would be best. I'd advise you to let me send out a broadcast for them. Mm, suppose we wait until Monday. If they haven't returned by then, you'd better broadcast it. All right. Will we come back Monday, then? Mm, yes. We'll let you know what's happened on Monday. <laughs> the weekend, Sergeant Wingerton checks the hospital, the morgue, the sheriff's office for news of the missing couple. But his inquiries are fruitless. When Mr. Britton returns Monday morning with no further news of the Steinhauers, Captain Stone informs Detective Lieutenants Guy Rudolph and Frank Condaff of the facts and assigns the two officers to the case. Their first step is to visit the Steinhauer residence. For several minutes, they stand on the front porch, ringing the doorbell. Well, I guess the kid's not home, Frank. Well, I didn't expect him to be. Captain said he was in court today. Well, let's try the house next door. See what the neighbors know about the Stein house. Yeah, it's a good idea. Come on. and Mrs. Steinhauer. And nobody here by that name. Yes, I know. They live next door, but uh, they don't seem to be at home. Do you know where they've gone? I didn't even know for just this minute what their name was. Oh, I see. You're not very well acquainted with your neighbors, then. <laughs> I haven't had time. They just moved in a couple of weeks ago. Oh, they did. Mm -hmm. Have you seen them in the past day or two? Oh, I haven't noticed. I've got too much to do around the house to keep tab on my neighbors. <laughs> But I saw the kid drive in in a new car, though. You mean Leroy Drake, then, have you? Well, I don't know what his name is. I suppose he was their son. When did the boy come in with a new car? Oh, I don't know. A couple of days ago, I suppose. Well, I really didn't notice much. Hmm. Well, what make of car was it? I don't know. It was a flashy thing, though. One of those stripped-down swords, I guess. Is there anything else you know about them? Anything else? I don't know anything about them. Well, thank you, just the same. Oh, you're welcome. The kid shows up in a new car on Saturday. The day he got five dollars from Britain because he didn't have enough to eat on. That looks a little strange. That night, the officers tail Leroy Drake as he drives off in his stripped down Ford. Their trail has not much consequence, but the youth only goes to Long Beach, picks up his girlfriend, and takes her to a movie. But the officers have not wasted time, for they are now in possession of the address of the girl and the license number of Leroy's car. Next morning, while a check is being made on the car, Condaffer and Rudolph present themselves at the Steinhauer house. Now, Mr. Drake, we'd like to get your angle on the disappearance of your aunt and uncle. Oh, gosh. I don't know what to make of it. They never went away like this before. I'm sure something terrible's happened to them. Well, maybe they just went away for a little trip. Oh, no. They wouldn't have done it without leaving me any money. And they didn't leave you any? No, not a cent. I had to borrow five dollars from Mr. Britton Saturday. And uh, what exactly did your aunt say to you on Friday morning? Well, she came to the door in my room about 5.30. She said she and Uncle Henry were going down to San Peter to see the landlady about the house and that they'd be back home soon. Is that all she said? That's all I can remember. I was pretty sleepy, of course. I feel sure something terrible has happened to them. I haven't been able to sleep ever since Friday. The suspense is awful. Oh, no, look, Drake. It doesn't seem likely anything could have happened to your uncle and aunt without us knowing about it. We sent their description and the description of their car all over the state by teletype. We're broadcasting their description to all police and sheriff's cars every hour. We've checked all the hospitals. If they'd had a serious accident, it would have been reported to us by now. Maybe they went over the edge of a canyon someplace up in the mountains. They might not be found for days. They might be in some lonely place now, suffering, needing help. No sense in getting so excited, Drake. You're letting your imagination get away from you, my boy. 
I'm sorry. But you see how upset I am? Yes. Yes, I see. Do you mind showing us through the house uh, just to check if everything's in order? Well, I've already looked all around and there's nothing out of place. Well, do you mind showing us? No. Let's start with this room first. That's their room. Oh. Well, nothing seems out of place here. How about those clothes in the closet? Anything missing there, Drake? Oh, no, sir. Their clothes are all there. Would you mind checking them over again, please? No, of course not. Hey, that is true. My address is gone. In one suit. How about baggage? Yeah. That is a suitcase gone, too. Well, then they could have gone on a trip, eh, Drake? Yes. It looks like it, doesn't it? But even if they did, they'd have gotten in touch with me before this. Something must have happened to them. Where is your room, Drake? Down the hall. Let's see it. Why? What do you want to look in there for? Hey, just for fun. Do you mind showing us? Very well. This way. Does your my uncle have any money, Drake? Yes, a little. Where is it? In the bank in Long Beach. Why in Long Beach? Oh, we used to live there until the first of the month. How much did your uncle have? Oh, about fifteen hundred dollars, I guess. Here's my room. Pretty much of a mess without my aunt here to clean it up. Well, uh, nice cozy room. Yeah, it's comfortable. That your car out back there? That strip Ford? Yeah, that's mine. My uncle bought it for me. What's this piece of glass here on the desk? Oh, that's an old porthole from the ship. I'm grinding it down to make a lens for a telescope. Mm. Interested in the story, huh? Yeah. yeah. I've been working for a year on that lens. Well, what's this gun here? More astronomy? Oh, no. Uh, there's some gadgets I got from my car last week. But I've been so worried I haven't felt like putting them on. Are these your papers in the desk drawer here? Yeah, just some old junk I saw in there. I see. Anything important, Frank? Mm, no, just not all job. Well, uh, what do you say? You ride over to the station with Guy and me, Drake. We've got to make a report, and then we'll all go out and have lunch, huh? Okay. I'd be glad to. At the station, the two detectives received a report on Drake's car, and then discussing the broadest generalities, they take the youth to lunch. An hour later, they drive him out to Exposition Park and begin to question him in earnest. Drake, uh, we understand from what you and Mr. Britton told us that you were broke Saturday and Mr. Britton lent you $5. That's right, he did. Yet among these unimportant papers we found in your desk drawer were uh, receipts from an automobile supply store for tires and other car supplies amounting to more than $12. These receipts were dated Saturday. You see, Lieutenant Condever. Now, don't I... start explaining until you've heard what we've got to say. You also stated to us this morning that your uncle had some money in a bank in Long Beach. In your desk drawer, we found bank books for savings and checking account in your uncle's name on a branch bank at 49th and Western. I can explain that, you see. You told us that your uncle had bought you that car. But we've checked the car and find that you paid $150 for it Saturday afternoon and that you bought it in your uncle's name. Now, how about it, Jake? What's the real story? I think you fellas know more about this than you're telling. Please don't keep me in suspense like this. What's happened to my uncle and my aunt? Oh, hysterics. Drake, we want to know the truth about that money. Well, I lied to you about the money, I guess. You guess? Yeah. Uncle transferred his bank account last week from Long Beach to a branch out on Western. And on Saturday, I transferred $400 from his savings account to his checking account. You transferred it? What do you mean? Well, I... I drew it out. I... You mean you forged your uncle's signature? Well, you could call it that, I guess, but I didn't figure it made any difference. You didn't? Why not? Well, you see, that money was left me by my grandfather. Uncle Henry was keeping it for me until I was 21. I figured I was entitled to it, seeing as how uncle and aunt had gone away and left me. Hmm. Where are your uncle and aunt, Drake? I don't know. I wish I did. But you guys know. You know a lot more about this than you'll say. They're dead, aren't they? Take me to them. Show me the bodies. The only one who can do that is you, Drake. What do you mean? I don't know anything about them. I don't know where they've gone. But you know. You found them. Probably dead in an accident, and you're keeping it from me. You're torturing me. Tell me what you've done with them. Where are you taking me now? Down to Long Beach. Down to Long Beach? What for? To see Maybell. Now, listen, Lieutenant. You keep Maybell out of this. She doesn't know a thing about it. She... Hardly knows me even. It didn't look that way the other night when you drove her home after the movies. What do you mean? We were following you. The two detectives.
detectives drive the frantic youth down to Long Beach to the house of his girlfriend, Maybell. The officers interview the girl on the front porch where they can keep an eye on Drake, whom they have left seated in the police car. Why, yes, Leroy came down to see me on Friday night. Well, what did you do? We went to a movie, but we only stayed through the first feature because he said he had to be home early. Did he give you any reason? Yes, he said that his uncle and aunt were leaving early the next morning to go on a vacation. What's this all about? Is Leroy in trouble? Well, not exactly, miss, but, uh... You see, his uncle and aunt, Mr. and Mrs. Steiner, are missing. We're trying to locate them. They're not missing. They're on a vacation. How do you know that? Why, Leroy told me. Well, when did they go away? Saturday morning. Now, how do you know this? Why, Leroy came down to see me Friday night. He left early because he said he had to see his uncle and aunt off early the next morning. That would be Saturday morning? Yes. You're sure of the days? Positive. Well, then something is wrong because Mr. and Mrs. Steiner have been missing since Friday morning. Oh. Take her inside, guy. I'm going to have another talk with Drake. Come along, man. What's Rudolph going inside with her for? What's he going to do to her? Nothing, kid. She's just getting her hat and coat and they're taking her up to jail. What for? She has nothing to do with this. She doesn't even know my uncle and aunt. They can't take any chances. Oh, you're taking her to jail. What about me? Am I under arrest? What does it look like to you? For what? Why are you arresting me? Suspicion of murder. Listen, Condapper. Maybell doesn't know a thing about this. She's absolutely innocent. You can't mix her up in it. We can't take any chances. Listen. I'll tell you all about it. Well, they don't get Maybell mixed up. Take me in there and I'll tell you all about it. In front of her. All right. Come on. Drake's ready to talk, guy. Go ahead. What's it all about, Leroy? Well, just sit down, honey, and I'll tell you all about it. It's going to be hard to take, but I've got to tell the whole thing. In the first place, Maybell, they got me on trial up in L.A. for auto theft. Leroy! Oh, I ain't guilty, honey. That's beside the point. I didn't tell you because I didn't want you to worry. But I couldn't keep it from my uncle and aunt. And they've been worrying plenty. Auntie's been brooding. Saying she couldn't face the shame of it. They sent me away. Uncle felt the same way, too, I guess, but he didn't say much. Anyway, they were a proud couple, but I guess that's the reason they did it. Did what? Committed suicide. Oh. Go on, tell us about it. Well, when we were finishing up supper Friday night, Uncle Henry emptied his coffee cup, and a minute later he was gasping for breath and asking for water. He got up and stumbled into the front room and fell down. I was bringing the water into him, and I heard a thud. And I looked around and I saw Andy fall on her tracks. I ran back and took her pulse. And she was dead. And I went back with the water for Uncle Henry, but he didn't need it. He was dead, too. Oh, no. Where are the bodies? I'm coming to that. I didn't know what to do for a while. I just sat there and looked at them. And it occurred to me that they were so afraid of the disgrace of me maybe going to Quentin, they'd be more ashamed if there was a lot of publicity about them committing suicide. So I figured I'd get rid of the bodies. Tell people they'd gone away, disappeared. Then they wouldn't be disgraced, see? I see quite clearly. Go on. There's nothing more to tell. You two guys know the rest. You found the bodies. That's the reason you've been playing with me all day like a cat with a mouse. You've got your confession. Only, ain't you surprised? It isn't a confession at all, see? I haven't done anything. Except help a couple of old people to hide their shame. Now, take it easy, kid. Take it easy. You jump at conclusions. We haven't the slightest idea where the bodies are. We had no suspicions of you when we started to question you this morning. It was your own guilty knowledge and the fact that we didn't accuse you that made you tell us the whole story, if you have. Now, finish it up. Where are the bodies? I drove them off the pier over in Wilmington. You drove them off the pier? Yeah. I put Uncle Henry in the front seat and Andy in the back seat and propped them up so they'd look natural. Pardon me, please. I can't stand any more of this. Yes. Go ahead, Drake. And I drove them down to Wilmington. I went out on a couple of piers, but there were too many people around. They were loading ships. And I found a nice deserted pier, and I got the car rolling, slipped it on a high, and jumped out. Went right off the end. Which pier was it? In Graceline Dock. I hung around for an hour to see if the bodies had float, but they didn't come up. So I went home. Are you telling us the truth? Of course I am. Unbelievable. Well, I guess I'd better call headquarters and have them send a diver over there, Frank. Right. 
and we'll go straight over from here. That is, if Drake doesn't mind showing us his uncle and aunt's watery grave. Not at all. I'd be glad to. Rudolph called the chief of detectives, Joe Taylor, has immediate results. By the time Drake and his police escort arrive at the end of the dock, a delegation of reporters and police officials are already there. And the fireboat, under the command of Captain Dykeman, with diving apparatus aboard, is steaming down the harbor. Here's the fireboat coming in. Think you can show us where the car went down, Drake? Yeah, I guess so. Okay, let's start dragging. The flat, dead sun dropped its molten disc into the diurnal grave. Its steaming spirit suddenly hisses across the gray waters of the harbor as the tiny boat drops its bluish fingers over the side. As night swats across the world, they scrape furtively at the harbor floor, metal hands groping for the lost dead. The silent group of the living, huddled together on the deck of the fireboat themselves, become the image of the dead as the tiny licking fingers of the fog embrace them, transform them into formlessness. Each man, peering into the black, oily water, dreads the accomplishment of the mission which has brought him there. Dreads that moment of horror to which no man can ever become accustomed. That moment when the sea gives back her dead. Hour after hour, the living slowly steam back and forth, vainly enticing the dead with bait of steel and wire. And time and time again, the sea with grim humor raises their hopes and their fears. As the hook takes hold, it is carefully hauled aboard, bearing not a corpse, but a waterlogged barrel, a rusted snarl of cable, the hull of a wrecked dinghy. But at last, the grappling hook catches, holds fast, will not move. The diving gear is quickly assembled. Captain Dykeman, assisted by two helpers, slowly squirms into the massive leaden shod suit. The great apocryphal helmet is placed over his head, folded into place. The pumps are started, the telephone tested, and supported by his men, the captain takes his place on the stage. Here is a figure worthy of the mission. Here, indeed, is an emissary to Hades, a god who wears 40-pound boots, whose head is one huge eye. Here is a cyclops who rests the dead from Neptune. Slowly, the stage drops beneath the surface. The harbor water slips up to the captain's waist, to his shoulder, laps about the window of his helmet, covers him. A grapefruit rind floating out to sea pauses to dance amid the bubbles of his exhaust valve as he disappears from sight. A moment of silence. And then the earphones of the helper on deck speak. Hold your cable. I'm on bottom. All right, hold the cable. Have you found it, sir? Yes. Steinhauer's body is hauled aboard to lie beneath the tarpaulin beside her husband. Con Daffer and Rudolph lead the emotionless Drake across the deck to the gruesome addition to their company. Drake, I want you to take a good look at these bodies and tell me if they're your uncle and aunt. Well, they look different. That's them, all right. taken back to University Station, where he is questioned by Con Daffer and Rudolph and Lieutenant Jack Donahue and Captain Stone. 
Stoutly, he sticks to his story that his aunt and uncle had entered into a suicide pact. But as midnight thins into dawn, it is evident that the relentless logic of the police is beginning to take effect. I don't see why you guys keep asking me these fool questions. You know more about this than you're telling. You've known more about it all along. You've been playing with me like a cat plays with a mouse. I'm sick of it. And we're sick of that crack brain story of yours. That your uncle and aunt committed suicide. Listen, kid. In the first place, we've got forgery on you on your own confession. You're in a tough spot, and it won't hurt you any to tell us the truth. I know I'm in a tough spot. But I can't do anything but tell the truth, can I? And that's all we want. You told us that your uncle and aunt died from poison coffee they gave themselves. Is that true? Yes. When did this happen? At dinner Friday night. But you told the sergeant last Saturday that the last time you saw your aunt was at 5.30 Friday morning when she told you she was going to San Pedro. Well? Is that true? Oh, yes. No, that, that is... Well, both statements can't be true. Now, what is the truth? Oh, will you let me go to sleep if I tell you the whole story? Gladly. We're just as sleepy as you are. Well, this is the way it happened. I told you how worried my uncle and aunt were about me being in trouble. That's the truth. And I worried about it, too. Not for myself, but it upset me how they were worrying. They were getting along. Over 60. I figured they wouldn't survive the shock and disgrace if I was to be sent to prison. It seemed to me that the kindest thing I could do would be to kill them. And then they'd never be unhappy about me. They'd never know what happened to me. Thought of a mercy killing, eh? You could call it that. Well, I thought of all the ways I could do it. I thought of driving them over a cliff. I was afraid they'd only be crippled instead of being killed. Then I thought of poison. I was afraid that an autopsy would show that up. Finally, I decided to poison them and then drive them off the dock where they'd never be found. And that's what I did. Oh. And you did this because you wanted to spare them the disgrace of your going to prison. Eh? That's right. That $1,500 bank account of your uncle that you've already committed forgery on couldn't have influenced you at all, I suppose. Of course not. Then anyway, that money was rightfully mine. Investigations by the officers proved that this third story of Leroy Drake's was indeed true. The youth was identified at the store where he had bought the cyanide that killed his uncle and aunt, and the bottle which contained the poison and also carried Drake's fingerprints was subsequently discovered. Drake was quickly brought to trial and pleaded not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity. But when the defense counsel realized the magnitude of the case we had built against his client, he threw him on the mercy of the court. On December the 17th, 1935, Drake was sentenced to life imprisonment in San Quentin Penitentiary on two counts of first-degree murder, and with a recommendation that he never be granted parole. Thank you, Chief Seeger. Ladies and gentlemen, for complete stories and descriptions of the true crime cases to be broadcast on this program, get the new June edition of the Calling All Cars News, given away free wherever Rio Grande cracked gasoline is sold. A double side, extra edition this month, full of true detective mysteries, radio and movie news. Rio Grande also offers, free to every boy and girl, a complete junior detective outfit of 14 valuable gifts. See the Calling All Cars news for details. While you're in the Rio Grande station, ask about Sinclair Motor Oil, the oil that pioneered the new processes you hear so much about nowadays. As one of the world's largest manufacturers of lubricants, Sinclair perfected the de-waxing and the de-jellying process which extracts all waste materials, leaving only pure oil that gives instant and complete lubrication the second you step on the stocker and provides an amazingly thin and unbelievably tough film of protection. Sinclair motor oils are so thin there's no drag to hold back the flying pistons of high-compression motors, and it's guaranteed never to break down at highest speed. You can get these great oils in refinery-sealed, tamper-proof cans, 
And your Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline dealer guarantees Sinclair Motor Oils to give you your money's worth. Sinclair Eyes for Lubrication Safety. Cancellation broadcast 132 regarding two missing persons. These missing persons have been found murdered. That's all. Roll.